Welcome everyone to today's tech talk on the Alice uh, programming language. Um, I'll point out we have Peter Norvig here today who's one of the biggest fans of Alice. Uh, Peter and his daughters, I believe, right? Um, I'm pleased to welcome my friends from Carnegie Mellon who are here today to talk briefly about the Alice 3D authoring environment. And they'll show us how it fits into computer science education. As many of you know, Randy Pausch started working on Alice back in the early 1990s. And these are the folks, this is the team that he is entrusting with her future. Uh, I've known Randy for many years, and I've been keeping a close watch on the Alice team and uh, the progress going forward. Uh, today, we'll hear from uh, Dennis, Cogr Dennis Cosgrove and um, the, the team uh, about the future of Alice. Dennis was uh, discovered by Randy Pausch, uh, and then I'm told, carefully uh, conscripted into indentured servitude uh, for the Alice project right from the beginning. Uh, Dennis has co-offered several papers and presented at various conferences, including SIGCHI. Unable to be with us today is Caitlin Kelleher, an assistant professor of computer science at Washington University in St. Louis. Um, Caitlin's graduate work at Carnegie Mellon featured uh, the development of Storytelling Alice, which, is, which introduces programming as a tool for telling stories. However, we are pleased to welcome Wanda Dan and Dan Jenkins uh, from Carnegie Mellon. Wanda recently accepted a position, uh, and, and faculty position at Carnegie Mellon, and now serves as the director of the Alice Project, um, a role for which she was handpicked by Randy Pausch. Um, please join me in welcoming uh, the Alice team to Google. Thank you. I wish to begin by thanking all of you for being here today. And thank you to uh, Jeff Walsh for arranging this meeting and to all of you for allowing us to give this presentation today. We want to particularly extend our thanks to Google for your continued support of this project. The Alice Project uh, has um, been a part of Carnegie Mellon University for the last 10 years. And I have been very pleased to join in that, uh, in that research group. As an overview of our presentation today, we're going to first talk about what Alice is. Then we will take a look at the current version of Alice, how it is being developed and researched, and its impact on pre-CS1 and high school students. By CS1, we mean the first rigorous course in computing majors at colleges and universities nationwide. Then we will take a look at Caitlin Kelleher's work with a special version of Alice called Storytelling Alice that she has tested with middle school girls. And finally, we will take a look at the future of Alice in the next version, which will be Alice 3.0 and our push into CS1. Alice is a 3D graphics and animation environment. It has a drag and drop interface. It allows the students to create a virtual world in which they put various objects and then tell a story, create a game, perform an animation task, you're going to see a demonstration of this environment in a few minutes. What are the research goals of this group, and how does ALICE II fit into or reach those goals? Well, basically, when we began to work in developing ALICE II, our goal was to better prepare students for a rigorous CS1 course. I do want to stress the preparation part of this. We do this in introductory programming courses in high school and in what are called pre-CS1 courses at the freshman level in college. I do want to make absolutely clear that we are not trying to dumb down CS1. What we have been trying to do is to better prepare students to do a good job in CS1. And we want to allow professors who are teaching the rigorous CS1 course the opportunity to actually strengthen the curriculum in that course. 
So how do we better prepare students for success in a rigorous CS1 course? Our goal has been to focus on the fundamental programming concepts. So we aren't really departing from the traditional kinds of concepts. We simply want to go about preparing students for understanding these concepts to greater depth. And we also want to make it easier to add into the traditional curriculum the object-oriented concepts. This has been a struggle for computer science instructors in college and university level because we still have the 14 weeks during the semester to teach the same traditional concepts that we've been teaching for 25 to 30 years. But we are now adding in the object-oriented paradigm and classes and objects do not make this process any easier. So we want the, ob the object-oriented concepts to actually be easier to learn so that we can focus on the traditional concepts of decision making, repetition, sorting, the various algorithms that we all know and love. And we want the students to be good problem solvers. And we very much like them to understand and be able to use effectively the logic involved in the programming. As I mentioned a minute or so ago, we really haven't changed the fundamental concepts that we want to teach. But what we are looking at is how we are doing that teaching and what tools we are using to do the instruction. Just to be honest, I started to teach computer science in the mid-1980s. And when I did so, I was teaching in C and in Pascal. And the first program that I taught was the Hello World program. And I'm sure you recognize that this program in Java is the same type of program. It's just somewhat different syntax, maybe a little more complicated. All it does is print out Hello World. When I start to teach a class of this type to today's students, what I find is that they look at all this code and they realize that what they've just done is they print it out to the screen, hello world, in this little black box. And then they look up at me and they say, and this is supposed to be exciting? I can just take a cell phone and type in hello world as a text message and send it out. That's cool. This is no longer considered to be a cool thing to do. And so really, in today's world with today's students who have iPods and cell phones and um, all kinds of multimedia in their world every day, the traditional programs that are still in our introductory level courses are just not exciting. So the question is, how do we turn today's students on to programming? How do we introduce them to programming in a very effective way and still not dumb down the curriculum? Well, what we decided to do is somewhat revolutionary. We wanted to take the traditional concepts and the traditional problem-solving techniques and not lose those but add some new ways of going about it. So we decided to change the design technique to storyboards. This is a technique stu students are familiar with. They're very uh, into the animation film industry. They love the films coming from studios such as Pixar and Disney. And so they understand this process, and we found this an easy way to get them interested in the design. We also wanted to use program visualization. We knew that the uh, change of state that occurs in the depths of the computer somewhere were simply not visible. We wanted to make that change of state visible. To do that, we used a technique called program visualization. And that's another talk all by itself. But we also wanted to talk about the highly motivating uh, features that we felt we could 
use from Alice the 3D graphics and the animation. The students find this very interesting. They do enjoy working with the animation. So what we're going to do is a brief demo of the Alice 2 system to give you a flavor of this. And then we will talk about did we or didn't we succeed. Dennis? OK, so I'm going to uh, give you a little demo of uh, Alice 2, which is currently available for free on the web and everything like that. Um, and this is Alice. And the idea, the, what you want you to take away from it is it's like the world's simplest. It's, the, it's an IDE that's designed to make it really easy to learn to program. And so um, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to add in an ice skater. And so I go to our gallery, and I scroll over to people. And, I'll, and I've sort of set up half of this scene. As you can see, there's already this frozen lake. And we're going to have a little ice skating demo here. I'm going to drag her in. And so then I can move her around in the scene. And what I'm going to do is just set her up so she's facing this way towards the hole. And I can click on the ice skater over here in our, our tree, which has all the objects that are in the system. You can see that the ice skater has a number of methods. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start to program. And I'm just going to drag and drop this method to tell the ice skater to move forward one meter. And I'm just going to play that and watch my program execute. OK, and so then when we're done, let's say after she's, we're going to do a little routine here. So let's have her, um, after she's done moving forward, let's have her turn all the way around. And so I'm able to quickly explore and play and learn to program, but I don't have to worry about where the commas go, where the parentheses go, if there's a semicolon or a colon, and just other things. Um, you can actually, uh, you know, we, we commonly think of things like uh, parallelism and uh, as being a complicated uh, uh, process, but we just sort of make it uh, complicated. Little kids actually have no problem at all with handling the do together construct. So let's say while she's moving forward, we want her to lift her leg while she's going. And so we'll select her right leg and have it turn forward a quarter. So while she's doing this, she'll do a little, her little routine. Um, so if you notice, I have this little hole precariously located over here. Let's place it right in front of her. And right now, I want to introduce some conditional programming. So let's grab, grab the if else clause. And the ice skater, in addition to having a whole bunch of methods that you know, animate and you can watch the state change over time, also has some questions or functions that you can ask her. And so let's ask, is the ice skater within, let's say, two meters of the hole? And if that's the case, then let's just have her move down 10 meters. Okay. And so now when I play it, it's going to happen. She's going to go over the hole, skate, and fall. And that wasn't a, that wasn't what I wanted, right? I want I don't want her to do her her turn over the hole. What I really want to do is have this turn happen down here in this else clause. But because it's not some hidden data and it's not um, summing up all the numbers and then taking the average and at the end getting the wrong number and not knowing where it went wrong along the way, it's you can see it execute so you can figure out really uh, much more quickly where your problems are. So um, just to blaze through and uh, get some more th uh, things that you'll commonly encounter in a computer science uh, class or all the concepts of computing, let's make a new method. And we'll call it skate up to and around. Okay. And what I'm going to have the ice skater do is in skate up to and around is I'm going teach to teach her to skate around the red cone. Let's say that's our first task. So we're going to have it turn to face the red cone. Okay, let me move the hole out of the way so we can actually get some stuff done. And I'll move these uh, cones out into the world a little. Okay. So first we'll have her turn uh, and face the cone. And then we'll have her move forward some distance. We're not sure how much, but let's just have her move forward a meter for now. And then we'll drag this in, just like the other methods, and have her skate up to and around when she's done with her. Move forward, turn. And then she's going to turn to face the red cone and move forward some amount. And again, we want to, um, want to be able to use a function here. And so we're motivated to use functions at this point because we want to know how far away to this particular thing. So rather than moving forward a meter, let's move forward um, the distance to the red cone. Okay? And again, I'm able to explore all these concepts of computing without having to worry about uh, syntax and everything 
sort of happens in front of me. I can watch it happen. And kids are able to tell these stories and make these games that are motivating as well. Um, we don't want to go all the way to the red cone. We're going to skate up to and around it. So let's drop off a meter from there. And then we'll have her turn left, say a quarter, and then turn all the way around the cone. And we'll do that by just using the cone as a reference frame, which is sort of a legacy thing from back when Alice was a uh, 3D graphics uh, system designed for making SIGGRAPH papers a long time ago. Um, OK. Uh, further, you can then parameterize this method. So you can say, well, what do you want to skate around? And then I can drop this in wherever there's the red cone. See what I got here. And now let's hook it up to skate around the blue cone instead. See if I was actually it's gonna go right. Okay. Okay. And one last thing, um, you can do, you know, a lot of people's first reaction to Alice is that it's you know, just a toy and everything like that. But you can really introduce, you can do recursion, you can do all sorts of things in Alice, whatever the teacher decides that they want to teach. Um, and in this case, I'm actually going to just run through like the iterating for loop uh, construct, uh, where now we're going to iterate around all the cones and have her do a little routine. So that's just a little flair, a little uh, taste of what uh, the ALICE 2 system is about. And at this point, I will hand it back to Wanda. Thank you. So as you have seen, we really haven't dropped all of the fundamental concepts. We've just made those concepts a lot more interesting, uh, a lot more attractive to today's students. Alice is downloadable from the web. And this has helped us to have the system adopt, adopted by many schools, many colleges. We'll talk more about that. One of the things that we found out in our research was that in order to have the software in use in classrooms across the country, we really needed to provide some instructional materials. Why is that? Well, because in addition to coming up with a 3D animation uh, system that could be used for teaching, we had to teach the teachers how to teach with the software. And so we developed many instructional materials for this. And in our philosophy of let's make it free, these instructional materials are also free for instructors on the web. As with any good research group, we now have to determine, well, does it work? Is it effective in teaching what we want to teach? Are we better preparing the students for success in CS1? We immediately found out that it's a highly engaging approach. It's very motivating. We get hundreds, literally hundreds, of emails every semester from instructors around the world. And they tell us that for the first time in their teaching career, they have students who linger at the end of class. They have students in closed labs who do not want to leave the room to let the next group of students come into the lab. The students are quite clearly enjoying the process, enough so that they sneak extra time to work with the software. They download the software on their own and put it on their own machines and work on it for many hours on the worlds that they are preparing. Fun? Oh my. <laughs> Well, what this means is you're going to get the Statlers and the Waldorfs out there who are going to say, well, if the students are having all that much fun, are they really learning anything? Hmm. Well, it's a reasonable question. Are they really learning anything? So we decided to do some formal studies in which we set up these pre-CS1 courses. We put in there the students who had had no previous programming experience who are typically at risk of not doing so well in a rigorous CS1 course. 
Then we followed them into CS1, and we did not tell the CS1 teachers who the ALICE students were. These students took the regular, rigorous CS1 class, and they took the same exams as everybody else, and we just wanted to know, how did they do? Hmm. We found their grades improved by a full letter grade, and we found that the retention of these students following them from CS1 into CS2 was nearly doubled. Textbook publishers tell us that the eight textbooks which are already on the market are selling like, like hotcakes. No kidding. One publisher tells us that their one textbook is now in, been adopted in approximately 10% of the colleges nationwide. That's a great success story. Backing that up, what we're finding is increased downloads from the alice.org website. We are approaching 1 million downloads at this point in time. So to sum up, what we found was that this no syntax-based frustration from the drag and drop interface and the fact that the objects are now visible and that the change in state that can be seen as the program runs and the highly motivating context of Alice has given us higher achievement and improved retention. So now what we're going to look at is, well, first goal, check. What next? Dennis? All right, so I'm going to talk about uh, another research goal, which is, so we've talked about retaining the students who come into, um, who want to be CS majors, but then end up getting turned away somehow. Um, what we want to talk about now is how do we attract more students into computing? And with this, I'm going to talk about uh, Caitlin Kelleher's uh, PhD dissertation. She just received her PhD uh, in computer science from Carnegie Mellon. And it's always tricky, I think, when you try to present someone else's work because it always gets blended in, um, you know, especially when they've moved on to a new university and everything like that. So one of the nice things about being at Carnegie Mellon is that you, it's got this great fine arts department, so you make friends with these artists who can draw pictures of your friends. And so this is Caitlin. And I try to, and she would probably kill me if she realized I was putting this. It's now on YouTube, so I'm sure she'll find out. But I'm going to put a little picture of her in the bottom corner just as a subtle little reminder that this is Caitlin's work which is especially important because now she's, a, she's uh, an assistant professor at Washington University in St. Louis and continuing in this arena. So I just definitely want to give her credit. So I have this big problem where um, we need more and better computer scientists, and they're just dropping out. Right? We actually have lost over half of our computing majors in the last seven years, which is pretty startling. What's even more um, disturbing, to me at least, is that we have this ever-widening gap between the, the men in computer science and the women in computer science. So that dotted first line is the men's uh, coming into uh, basically declaring themselves as probable CS majors. And the bottom, we have the women. And what you'll notice is what's really disturbing is that you know, we've actually reached new lows here. We've actually got the lowest level since in the last 30 years as far as women coming into computer science. And so how do we address this? And so if you want to get more women into computer science, right, you ha the, basic, uh, the basic idea is that you have to get them early. And that's before they turn away from math and science, which is generally uh, considered to be you have to get them by middle school. So what Caitlin set out to do was a rather ambitious goal was to build a system that would lure, that would lure middle school girls into programming. Okay? So how do you do this? Well, the first observation is that easy isn't enough. And that we in the uh, Alice Research Group were, you know, the other people, you know, the boys in the group, um, were essentially just working on making it uh, easier to program. So we're just trying to lower all the barriers. We're getting the syntax out. We're making this program visualization. We're just making it so it's easier uh, to learn how to program. And this is an actual quote from an actual 12-year-old girl who was going through one of our tutorials where you get to play with this stupid bunny. And she's like, OK, so I can move the bunny around, but why would I want to? And what Caitlin found was that if you, if you, if you can build, if you can provide the, the, the support to, uh, for storytelling, if you can present programming as the means to, end, to the end of, of programming, you can actually lure, lure uh, uh, middle school girls into, into computing. 
And so just as a comparison, there's a whole bunch of really good results that she, came, that she discovered in her dissertation. And I'm just going to uh, highlight a few of them here. And one of them, just to sort of compare the differences between uh, generic or ALICE 2 to storytelling ALICE, the system that she built, is that in ALICE 2.0, all the objects are created equal. If you notice, when I brought in the ice skater, I went to the gallery and I went to the objects and I sort of scrolled over to people because it's listed alphabetically, which when you think of it now is pretty embarrassing that people are somehow just at the same level as chairs. And because we built this system that was designed to um, be generically useful for everything. So we have these generic methods that come from our you know, legacy of being a 3D graphic system. So we have move, turn, and roll, and resize, which, sort of, which uh, are analogous to translate, rotate, and scale from the graphics community. And these are sort of useful. These are, you know, they're, they're, they make it possible to do anything, but they're not really well suited to do things for articulated figures like people, which is, you know, something you really want to be able to do. And so she did all this um, uh, formative evaluation where she's got all these people coming in and using her system and keeps iterating on it. And she basically determines that what you need to do to support storytelling is you need to be started off with all, the, it has to be people centric. And then those people need to be able to communicate. They need to be able to walk around. They need to be able to change posture, attend to things, interact with things, which actually these methods are really bad for, um, especially when you start uh, accumulating Euler angles on joints. It's just a disaster. And it's a disaster for everyone, not just seventh, seventh grade girls. So she comes up with all these methods. She builds this wonderful system. And then like any good PhD student, uh, she does a uh, summative evaluation. and she gets these representative students. She draws from the Girl Scouts so they're not self-selecting. She decides this wonderful sort of classic control group versus experimental group thing. It's really got all these clever little things, which you know, I, uh, I suggest you all go and look into it. It was really fabulous. I'm just going to uh, point out a couple of little things, but just one thing about it. And so while the students are using the two systems, um, she's comparing sort of Alice 2 is the green bars and storytelling Alice are the blue bars. She tracks what everyone does. And basically, everything you do in Alice can be pretty much fit into three categories. Doing scene layout, so moving the ice skater around on the, on the lake, if you will. Editing your programs and running your programs. And obviously, if you want people to be, uh, learn, if you want people to learn how to program, if you can get them to spend more time editing their programs and less time doing interior decorating and just moving stuff around, that's good. But you actually have to do something to pull them into programming. And so, Nicely, uh, if you compare the bars, it's over here in, uh, this is just how much time they spend in each activity. And you can see that um, the girls who are in the uh, ALICE 2 condition spend a lot more time doing scene layout than editing the program. Right? We get all these people, we draw all these girls into programming. What I find even more encouraging than that is if you look at this, this scatter plot, of, this is all the girls who are in the, um, all the you know, Girl Scouts who are in the, uh, in the generic ALICE 2.0 condition. And over here, we have the time spent on scene layout. And on the horizontal, you know, vertical axis, time spent on scene layout. Horizontal axis, time spent editing their program. So just to be a gross metric, lower and further to the right are good. Okay? Um, you see this whole population of girls who do nothing but um, lay out the scene. Because either they try to edit the programs, and there's just nothing they want to do, or they just don't get drawn into it. But there's this whole population of girls who don't do any programming. If you overlay on top of that all the girls in the storytelling condition, condition, all of them do some healthy amount of programming. And as you might imagine, all the girls in this group learn a lot more about programming than those girls. So like I said, um, Caitlin is continuing with this research. And um, if anybody is interested in this whole thing, I, I uh, suggest that you contact her. This is our web page, but you can also just type in Caitlin Kelleher into Google, or uh, Caitlin Alice into Google, or Alice into Google. There was storytelling Alice. OK. So I've been telling you all this. Uh, we've been going on about how uh, storytelling is good. If you bring it in, you can bring all these new people into computing. So I think I'll take this moment to tell you a story. So I'm at the airport, and I got my Google t-shirt on. And I get up to go to the bathroom. And you know, sometimes when you're waiting for your flight, and you've been working, and you're tired, and you're not really paying attention, and you're sort of spaced out a little? So as I wake, make my way into the, uh, the restroom, I'm confronted by all of these women. And I immediately realize I've walked into the ladies' room. So I sort of sheepishly turn around and start walking back out. And this woman behind me says, 
you're feeling lucky, all right. So there you go. That's an actual true story. So with that pathetic attempt at humor, we'll talk about what's next. And so the biggest demand that we get from Alice right now is from CS1 professors. You might as you might imagine, you can show people that if you add a new pre-CS1 class, you can improve everyone's grades and retention. And everyone's like, well, that's fine, but I either can't or don't want to do that. So what a lot of people want to do is simply take Alice and use it for the first couple of weeks, introduce them to the concepts, and then immediately get them to a professional programming language. Now, whether or not you think that's a good idea or not, I personally would think you, know, you could wait longer. But whatever they want to do, we're trying to support them. Um, the problem with this is, is that well, if we get, when we get feedback from people right now, this is what they're having the hardest time with, is that they're able to introduce people to the concepts of computing, and that's working really well. And it's helping them. It's obviously helping them. Their grades are going up by a full letter grade later. But if you think about it, we've just taken out one part of the problem. And then when they, when they, get, when they go to move to Java, what happens is, is all at once, right? They hit them with the syntax then some professional IDE, which is really complicated. If they're lucky, there are actually a lot of people who still use makefiles in CS1. Um, they change the API on them. So they're used to using, um, you know, they're used to telling the ice skater to move and turn or use these higher level methods. And all of a sudden, we change that on them. And we foist hidden data, hidden data on them as well. So we take out the program visualization. Do all this at once, and you actually have this uh, you know, it's 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 better than not having Alice beforehand, but it still could be it still could be better. And one of the big mantras for the Alice project is one pro hard problem at a time. And so, like we've said before, we don't want to dumb down computer science. We're not trying to make it out like this isn't uh, a field without its challenges. But the way I think of it a little bit is that it's like if you want everyone to be able to park an 18-wheeler at the end of your course, the way we approach computer science is a little bit like we sit them down in the 18-wheeler on day one of the class have them deal with everything from day one, and say, and look, some of them make it through at the end. Um, another approach would be to start people off in an automatic little compact car and get them familiar with that. And once they, get, they can deal with that, they move on to the standard transmission, and OK, you've got that, and now we want you to deal with just the tractor. We're not going to put the trailer on as well, and then we add the tractor and the trailer. And I like this analogy because, a little bit because a lot of people think syntax is important, right? And to drive an 18, to park an 18-wheeler, you do have to know how to do a standard transmission, right? But once you don't have to handle them all at once, right? And once you've got the standard transmission down, it really isn't a problem there or not. And neither is syntax, really. It's just a problem at the beginning, right? Once you've got it down, it's not really a fundamental problem. So what are we going to do? We're going to apply all the lessons we've learned and build Alice 3. So we're going to keep the drag and drop to prevent syntax errors. We're going to keep the program visualization. We're going, to, we're going to have this transition to Java, which is going to, be, going to make it so that people can just seamlessly uh, move on. And we're going to provide this storytelling thing. So we're going to focus on the people. We're going to have all these higher level animations. It's going to be all these social animations. We're going to let people create. Uh, there's going to be all these characters that they can make in their own image. And it's like, how are we going to pull all this off is the real answer to the question, or the real question. And if you look at it, these are the sort of things that a, uh, your sort of typical academic computer science research group can do. Right? But to do this right requires a lot of modeling and animation talent, a lot of artistic talent that you don't typically have. And so it was right about this time that Randy comes to me. We're like talking about doing Alice 3. And he's like, I've got a shot at getting all the assets to The Sims 2, which to me at the time seemed about as likely as this incredibly ambitious spider's plan. But the spider's right. If we pull this off, we'll eat like kings. And as I've already alluded to you earlier in my embarrassing story, I'm feeling lucky. So let's go. And for those of you who don't know much about The Sims, I certainly didn't at the time. I hadn't played it before, but I, I started playing. Um, the Sims is the best-selling PC game of all time. Um, it's the best-selling franchise. And unlike most of the things on this list, it actually has more female players than male players. And when this whole thing was starting to come to reality and it looked like it was actually going to happen, I started playing The Sims, and I got to see exactly why. It's absolutely the perfect match for what Alice wants. And so when it was becoming a reality that this was actually going to happen, people at EA actually they asked us, 
Well, is there a different game that you'd rather have? Because maybe, you know, they make a lot of games. It's like, is there something else that would be better suited? And I was like, no, it's perfect. And the reason why it's perfect is not just from all the things we learned from Caitlin's research, but there's also this book called Unlocking the Clubhouse, which is a really, it's a great book, and it's been very influential on me, and it really opened my eyes to a lot of the reasons why we have this gender imbalance in computing. But they described this study by Brenda Laurel at Interval, and one of the things they determined was what would be the ideal adventure game for girls. And it would, have, it, would, it would basically take place in everyday real life settings. It would have new places to explore. It would have a strong storyline. But the characters in it would be everyday people, as real to the girls as their best friends. And success in the game would be determined by uh, development of friendships, which is exactly what The Sims is. It's just a perfect match. And so one of the things I want to make sure I emphasize is that you know, we're talking a lot about how we're going to make this so that we can attract girls into computing. But just like The Sims seems to have this, this characteristic that you can bring uh, females in but not turn away the males, Alice also seems to have this property where you can provide these higher level animations, provide the storytelling theme, bring in some of the girls into computing but not turn off the boys. Okay. So why would electronic arts do this? Right? Uh, the first thing is never underestimate the power of executive vice presidents who have middle school daughters who just turned away from math and science. Okay? It really hits home. You show them the results of Caitlin's work, and they know exactly what you're talking about. Their, their, their daughters just, you know, they were fine. They loved math and science, and all of a sudden middle school hits, and they decide it's not for them. And the other thing is that they, believe, that they determine that it's in their best self-interest, self right? It's in their vested self-interest to improve the talent pool, because they hire a lot of computer scientists. So if they can make, if they can bring more and better people in, then they'll have better people to hire. And they're also, in, they're especially concerned with bringing more women into computer science. You know, they want to bring more girls and women into computer science so that they can hire more women to build more games that maybe they can tap better into the, the uh, female game market. Okay. And what, so what is Alice 3, get, Alice 3 going to be? Okay. Just to reiterate, it's going to be drag and drop, program visualization, line for line Java. So when you're executing things, the old Alice was sort of had its own virtual machine and sort of interpreted things and it had its own way of doing things. But like you were talking about earlier, like when you want to do overriding, how do you do overriding? You just override. Um, it's going to be all Eclipse underneath so that, again, to facilitate this transition to uh, when, the, when the professor decides to do that. We have the storytelling th uh, theme from Caitlin's dissertation, and we're going to use the Sims 2 assets to pull it off. Um, we're on track for uh, ha having our alpha test next fall. It's at Carnegie Mellon and Ithaca College. And the next uh, semester, we're going to open it up to a wider beta test. And one of the things we found that works really well there is um, the reaction to just demoing Alice 3 is you can show them in any half-baked form and they just want it. Um, and so when you have a lot of people who want to use it, you can uh, basically make them assign a bug-catching TA to each class so that a lot of times what happens when you're in a classroom and the software has bugs in it, um, the TAs will want to help the student get past it because they've already wasted some time, and which makes sense. I mean, that's good. But while you're in the beta testing uh, part of the process, you want to have a TA who's solely responsible for going around, finding a bug, helping chronicle it, and send it in to us so we can fix it. And so with that, I'll give you a sneak peek uh, into Alice 3. There you go. And so, oops. So the first thing that, you know, uh, as I said on the slide, um, it's going to be ready for alpha next uh, fall. So as you can imagine, it's not all done. So I'm going to show you uh, a number of pieces to the pie, and hopefully you can be able, we'll be able to pull it all together at the end. And this part is just to give you a feeling for what it's going to look like. This isn't exactly how it's going to look like, what it's going to look like. But you know, we'll have you know, the ability, you'll have the, the sort of the, the scene that you're working on over here in the top right. We're actually able to, if you recall, in Alice 2 is actually kind of busy. Right? There's a lot of stuff going on. And what I like about this system is that it's becoming more complicated underneath, but the interface is actually becoming simpler. Um, and because we're going with these higher level methods and people-centric uh, approach, we can get rid of that whole tree where you had to see the skeletons of everything and all the cones and all these other things and just go with the people. So you can actually collapse these two things into the same. So here we have the uh, methods, you know, actions, questions, and properties. 
and you'll be able to pick up and drag and drop and all that other good stuff. I'm going to show you a little bit of how it's going to react because um, although Alice is pretty successful, it does a really bad job of giving, well, it doesn't do a good enough job of giving enough feedback. So just giving people a little bit more feedback on uh, you know, how it's going to look. This is, again, just a little demo of how it's going to feel. Um, another thing is, oh, and uh, just to let you know, this is a little bit of a demo I'm going to show you in a minute, which is a daughter trying to ride her dad to get into shape. Um, another thing I want to show you is um, just having these docking bays and trying to give people cues about type. And so, for instance, you know, this is whether or not the daughter is facing something. You can see like the Boolean things will light up and go in there where that goes. And again, if you look at the dad, you'll be able to, you know, when you pick this up, the dad's name is a string, so it fits into the string docs and everything like that. So we're just going to try to give people some feedback there. Um, moving on, I'm going to show you just the person builder. This will just give you a little uh, feel for just how many, uh, you know, just the, the vast change in the content that we're going to be able to have. Um, so, first of all, there's a problem right there is that, uh, you know, when you have a games thing and you try to bring it into uh, middle school classrooms, the, uh, the, the female outfits are going to have to be called a little. If that makes any sense. <laughs> for adoption. One of the things I like about um, having all these things, you have all these, there's, there's all these males and females characters, there's a superhero character. <laughs> um, one of the things that's, um, that, this is actually kind of um, embarrassing, but uh, when we first made Alice, when we first made Alice, we had all these freely contributed models from this class at Carnegie Mellon, and it was great, but all the, the, models, and anim all the models and animations were sort of made by students at Carnegie Mellon, and that's sort of a narrow subset of the population. And so then it was used at inner city schools in these after school programs, and they couldn't make anybody in their own image. And that's really bad and embarrassing for a lot of reasons. Um, but it's nice to be able to have this, have all their assets because you can make, kids can make these characters in their own image. They can be male or female. And I really like the ability to, to be able to say that anybody can be the ambulance driver, right? That we're not steering anybody down any path. And just to sort of overreact to the whole thing, we made it so you can make green people now and everything just because, you know, it's really bad to not be able to do it. So for the purpose of this demo, we're going to uh, have a daughter. We have a little story we want to tell. The daughter's going to try to ride her dad to get in shape. So let's get uh, the dad an outfit here. Um, personally, they're just, my personal favorite is the, uh, where is it? The red smoking jacket. Very nice. Um, but let's get him a, a sweatsuit. We'll give him the blue walking outfit. We'll change his hair color here and give him the old, the old chrome dome so it's kind of, you know, little dad sort of situation. And again, this is just a very, a prototype. It's going to be, hopefully, it'll be much smoother than this eventually. And when we accept this, again, this is sort of behind the scenes, but it's going to generate the code to insert this into your world, if you will. And the students won't see any of that, but there's actual Java instances that back each of these things. So we make this dead. And the next piece of the puzzle, um, and this is a prototype that is running on top of Eclipse. So Eclipse is now, for those of you who know, don't know about Eclipse, Eclipse is this fabulous uh, integrated development environment. Um, but it's definitely, it's wonderful at helping you manage the complexity of a million line program. And it's not good at all for uh, your first introduction to computing when you're not, when you don't have to deal with a million line program. Um, so what we want to do is we want to use their framework to build the IDE that's designed specifically for uh, learning to program. And so you can see here we're sort of, we're parsing arbitrary Java 1.5 code. And you can sort of pick up these blocks and move them around. And um, you can press play and you can see this world play out. I actually haven't shown you this yet, so let me show it to you. So you need to shape, get in shape, Dad. Let me move it over here so you can see the world a little bit. And then he's going to loop three times. He's going to do a sit-up while she counts it out. And then, like me, he'll get a little tired. <laughs> and uh, you know, she'll sort of ride him, and then he'll start doing uh, st do another loop. And he's going to put in a little conditional thing where if the daughter's facing him, he's going to sort of show off and do these one-handed push-ups. And if she's not facing him, he'll kind of slack off. And then whoop. Okay. 
And so there's some concern when you take out all these lower level methods that people will still be able to program, still be able to do things. But in 20, you know, in basically 10 lines, you're able to build a little story where people laugh at the appropriate moment. And so that's really encouraging. And you can change these. This is just a little demo, but you can change this thing to do 10 times, and it does all the incremental compiling and everything, and it'll run it 10 times this time. Um, but that's just a little technology demo. I can speed it up. Whoop, 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 whoop. There you go. And for just the last little example of it, what you can imagine, since that's an eclipse, the eventual, uh, for those of you who know eclipse, the eventual thinking, uh, the eventual plan is to be able to just Okay, so the professor decides we've done enough of the concepts. I want people to actually learn the syntax of Java now. That they'll just be able to turn essentially into Java perspective and just start typing in Java. And then maybe at some point they decide, oh, we want to go back and learn about the iterating for loop. They go back into Alice, drag and drop. And the thing about this is, is you just have to worry about one problem at a time, right? You don't switch. You, con you don't switch the, the classes that you're working with, the API, like everything, all the data doesn't become hidden. You just take on one problem at a time and you march towards uh, getting people fully prepared. And so uh, the final thing is, of course, that then here's the Java code behind it. And you can you know, say something like, Dad, you really need to get in shape and something. And eventually, you know, they could just go all the way out and be in Eclipse or some other IDE. Oh, who knows why it's not working. There you go. Um, and so, there you go. Just to sum up, okay. What we're aiming to do, what we're aiming for, is to be the way everyone is introduced into programming. Okay. We believe that if you're going to be, if you're going to learn to program at any level, anywhere, your first exposure to it should not be with syntax and all these other and hidden data and all these other things that everyone should be able to start out this way and then transition. Okay? And this is rather ambitious, but with all the incredible positive feedback we've, re we've received from the previous versions, we have reason to believe this. And I hope you do too. And with that, I would like to thank you very much for your coming, your time, your attention, um, your support, free t-shirts, and we'd be happy to take any questions you have. Okay. What do you see as part of the strength of each one of them? With what environment do you recommend? I really like Carol. I learned the first thing I ever used was Carol. There's actually a Carol interface with um, with Alice, um, and so that's a little point to uh, say is that if people want to teach different ways, right? We we're going down the storytelling telling route, but if somebody wants to go down the Carol route or the logo route, we're going to try to support those as well. Um, uh, if somebody wants to go down the games route, if somebody wants to go down the Google's API, uh, Google Maps API route, right, um, or the physics route. Um, so we're going to try to support all those things. Um, I love Carol. What, uh, what Caitlin would say is that, that that doesn't draw enough people in. I also love Logo. Right? I also love Squeak. Um, but that in some ways, those things don't draw people in enough as the storytelling things. It worked for me. I think it's fabulous, but it, it isn't inclusive enough, I don't think. So if I can jump in on this, uh, I would like to say that we feel like we are standing on the shoulders of giants. Yeah, definitely. Uh, and we owe Rich Pattis a lot for Carl the Robot. Uh, so that said, uh, I would also like to say that I think what we're going to see in Alice 3 is a progression to a point where we can move back and forth between the Alice interface and the professional language IDE. And um, that was very difficult to do with um, the versions of Carl the Robot. Um, this is probably a pedagogy um, point. But nonetheless, that's what we're trying to do, <laughs> is to teach. Yes. Scratch as 2D. Right. Uh, but are there any deeper sort of differences in your approach and theirs? At least until you get to the issue of this transition to you know, 
know, CS1. Right, I think there's definitely a lot of overlap, and that's because of Squeak, which we both, I mean, everyone who's been a student in our research group has ended up doing an uh, internship with Alan Kay, almost. Um, I, th I think one of the things is the approach that we've latched on, at least at Carnegie Mellon, in the, um, we're going to team with a pedagogy expert who's going to write a textbook and make it so that we're going after this formal education part. And they're more of the play thing. But I, 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 I'm, I'm a big fan of, you know, of so that I whole thing, too. sort of a transition, magnet year old son. Right. I could see a transition sort of from scratch to, to Alice and yep. then to, you know, more formal right. sorts of things. I think one of the things is that, you know, you have to, it seems that, the status quo isn't working, and something has to be done differently. And I don't know if that's Alice or Scratch or whatever, but we're certainly going down this road. But you know, obviously, big fans of certainly, certainly Squeak and, and Scratch. I think there are many of us working on this problem, and we are fans of Scratch as well. Yeah. Um, so There's actually a full. Oh, so go ahead, sir. We have really uh, highlighted today for you our appeal to girls and young women. I, uh, however, have been in the classroom teaching with Alice for several years now, and I have found that the guys are just as turned on by Alice as the girls. Um, the guys have very different contexts for the stories they tell and they prefer to build with Alice interactive games. And as much as we have tried to tone this down, there's only one gun in Alice in the gallery. Um, nonetheless, they find ways to uh, tell the stories they want to tell. It's rather interesting, however, that uh, over the course of the semester, they tend to be very, very creative and come up with things that are not just shoot 'em ups. The other thing is, there is actually, um, a, it seems all the anecdotal stuff that comes in seems like it's bringing in the women, but it's not turning away the men because you know everyone wants to direct or whatever. Uh, but there is a, a study in the plans to do the same study with the Boy Scouts, so that you can formally show that, it, that these things are happening. And that's in the, in the pipeline. Yeah. Don't know which one. Go ahead. Go ahead, yeah. Um, in uh, getting access to all these assets from EA, um, did, did, how did this affect your, uh, your system? Did it raise your minimum specification machine? Did, it, did you have translation issues? How well, was it? It's surprisingly, well, my first, I was really surprised at how well it ran. First of all, the whole thing is rendered in Java and all these other things. Um, but then I realized that The Sims is a game that's designed, like it runs really well on a five-year-old laptop, because The Sims 2 came out more than five years ago. So the assets are designed to run on those. So it is a much more complicated, I mean, it's doing real-time skinning algorithms and all these other things. But it really, it, I thought it was going to be more of a problem than it really was. Um, because it's designed for older, it's designed for an older machine. And it's also designed, it has um, levels of detail, so you can fall back to lower level uh, models and textures and everything. So it hasn't been as big a problem as I thought it was going to be. Uh, well, I think you have done a great job on it. I mean, excellent tool. Uh, a little danger here is that are we raising the expectation, like, too much, like, I mean, writing a program, I mean, like, when you're in the middle school, I mean, moving these objects, but then later on, I mean, asking the, the same person, like, and spending, I don't know, like, days to write, like, a C program that does, like, I mean, something, like, very simple. Like, is it, like, how does this transition may like, work? Like, I mean, that's, that's something that I'm a little worried about. Well, I think one of the things is that if you're shooting for the middle school age, what I'd really like to, you, know, you could almost take the exit condition from that being they just know that they can do it. If they just have the confidence that they know that they can do this and that they can do cool things in computing, it doesn't all have to be whatever. If you just had that one thing, right, that would almost be good enough. 
But also, I mean, there are, there are hard problems in computer science. It's not like somehow dragging and dropping is going to make synchronization of you know, multiple threads going to all of a sudden become easy. Um, but the idea is to get more. What we want to do is we want to stop having the filter be on the wrong things. If you're filtering people because they can't handle logic, well, then that might be OK. If you're filtering people because they get frustrated because they used a colon instead of a semicolon, that seems really dumb if they're able to handle synchronization and you know, multiple nested you know, conditional statements. Sorry. Yeah. I also uh, would say that although we have talked today about um, computing majors, it is also the case that that first course in computing is for non-majors. And that means that you have people who want to learn how to use computing to do um, biochemical research, um, neurology research. Um, so you know they want to be physicists. Uh, all of these uh, other majors are taking this course as well. And we need to make it accessible. Um, and so I think looking at this broader range of population is very important for us. One thing we didn't say about ALICE 3 is because it is implemented in Java and because the students will transition into the Java environment totally, um, we anticipate that many researchers will build what we call thin APIs to allow them to assign to their students problems in engineering and problems in physics and so forth and so on. Um, and that, we think, is a very interdisciplinary part of this project. It would also be nice if you, you know, when you're talking about having these other people who are not intended to be computer science majors, it would be nice to show them that to draw them into computer science and be like, oh, maybe I don't want to do biology. Maybe I want to do computing. And we can get better, more and better people into the field. Do you feel that you've addressed the missing piece that Peter Norvig was talking about? Could you respond to that? I think you heard him earlier ask this question. So what was the, uh, the? Basically, he was concerned about the fact that Alice 2 is not truly object oriented, oh, right, right. meaning that it is not fully implemented. So you can't do inheritance in Alice 2, for example. But because we're moving into Alice 3 with the Java underneath and the line for line equivalency between the Alice code and the Java code, um, we believe that as much as Java is object oriented, so will Alice 3 be object oriented. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you, Thank you so much.